for those people who are familiar with Manica, I'm going to review the octahedral model. And for those people who are not uh, familiar with Manica, because we have both levels in this group, then um, I'm going to be just talking about something called Manica's octahedral model, which you would have heard of, I hope, and probably thought, oh, that sounds really complicated. It's actually not complicated, so I'm going to be talking about it just really quickly for about five minutes. And then Paul is going to talk about what he finds uh, valuable about Manica acupuncture. Um, so we'll just do two very short presentations and then we're going to open it up to your questions and we'll just try and um, answer your questions about Manica acupuncture. So that's basically what we're going to be doing for the next hour. Um, so I'll start off right away. Um, Dr. Manica, there he is, uh, was a medical practitioner uh, and a researcher and an acupuncturist, and he was fascinated by traditional acupuncture methods. And he spent a lot of time um, uh, devising repeatable experiments uh, to figure out the uh, meridian system. And he came up with something called Dr. Manica's octahedral model, uh, which is crucial to under understanding of Manica. So I'm going to talk about it with uh, an analogy or a thought experiment. So I'd like you all to imagine that you've got a balloon in your hand. And as you can see, a balloon, apart from the bit where you blow in the air, is a round sphere uh, and it has no front, no back, no up nor down. Um, but you know, if you, if you rub a balloon on your pullover, it gets kind of a static charge so you can glue it to the wall and in this thought experiment, we're going to glue it to another balloon. So now we've got two balloons. We've immediately got an axis uh, which separates left from right. And now we're going to rub some more balloons and we've got four balloons. And now we've got two axes. We've got one separating uh, left from right and one separating top from bottom. And if we get more balloons and we rub them together and we've got eight, then we've actually got three axes. We've got another axis which separates uh, front from back. So now instead of thinking about balloons, let's think about a zygote. Uh, so that, and then there's a first cell division, there's a second cell division, uh, which is two. And there's a first cell division, which is two. There's a second cell division, which is four. And then the third cell division, you've got eight. So within those first three divisions of the zygote, uh, you get the three axes of yin and yang, superior, inferior, left, right, and uh, uh, anterior, posterior. Now, can you see, I hope you can see my finger. If you connect these axes up, if I connect the top of that axis to this one, to this one, I get a triangle. And if I connect this one here to that one there, and this one here, I get another triangle. So if I connect all those axes up, those three primary axes, what I end up with is this shape, an octahedron. So Dr. Manica thought that the octahedron is formed within those first three divisions of the embryo. And then that shape remains topographically the same, even as the embryo develops, uh, those aspects of yin and yang remain intrinsic uh, to the, the topography of our bodies. And when we look at it here, <clears throat> you can see uh, that there are still uh, four anterior quadrants and four posterior quadrants. Let me just go back one slide. So four anterior quadrants there and four posterior quadrants and same here. So the beauty of Manica's system was using this model. He thought, well, look, I want to do regulation treatment on the whole body. I want to do a root treatment. I want to regulate the chi and blood. And the way I can do it is by regulating the chi and blood flowing in these eight octants in the four anterior quadrants and the four posterior quadrants. And the way I can do this is by using 
uh, primarily the eight extras, because the eight extras, if you think about the renmai, is this longitudinal uh, axis here, and the daimai is this horizontal axis, and the yangwei mai here is dividing front from back. So he created a model using the eight extras, uh, and he used that model to regulate the flow of qi circulating in these four anterior and posterior quadrants. And this is my last slide. He did it in a very systematic way. Um, it's called, originally it's called you know, Manica's four-step yin-yang balancing protocol. Uh, I'm trying to rebrand it and just call it Manica acupuncture or Manica style acupuncture. But he had a four-step protocol and these four steps you can think of as kit bags. Uh, and each kit bag has a specific item of clothing. So we can say uh, one kit bag is everything that you wear on your chest. And another kit bag is everything you wear on your legs. And another kit bag is everything you wear on your head, like hats and caps and scut um, maybe a fourth one is everything you wear on your hands. So as long as uh, that item of clothing fits in the kit bag, it belongs in one, two, three or four. So his treatment principles are the same. Anything that accomplishes the goal of step one, which is to release the yin aspect of the body, goes into this step one kit bag. So anything that releases the belly, the yin aspect of the body, was step one. In step two, the goal was to release the yang aspect of the body, so the back or the backs of the arms, the backs of the legs. So anything you do that fits into that category is done in step two. And step three was to adjust the posture of the body. So anything that you do in your work that adjusts the posture of the body, you put into step three. And step four, which is the part that Manika found the most fun, um, was symptom relief. So anything that you do that relieves your patient's symptoms fits into step four. So basically, step one and step two form part of the root treatment. Step three is a postural adjustment, which might be uh, useful. And finally, step four is symptom relief. OK, so that is uh, a quick overview of Manica. I hope you enjoyed that. And now uh, I'm going to hand you over to Paul. And Paul's going to talk to you about um, what he loves about Manica acupuncture. Thanks, Aaron. That was great. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Well, one of the aspects that I feel is the most uh, all-pervading when you come to the work of, of Dr. Manaka is that he established a, a group around him and in 1968 or thereabouts, they created something called the Topology uh, Acupuncture Association. And these people were looking at understanding the traditional model based on current ideas that were circulating. So you'll see in Dr. Dr. Manaka's book, Chasing the Dragon's Tail, some you know, heavy duty theory that revolves around uh, general systems theory and quantum physics and and so forth and all these ideas w he realized were a language that was able to ex explain traditional ideas that seemed to the western model at the time you know airy fairy uh, like energy or chi i mean you have to remember today that's become quite an acceptable idea and term but back then western medicine was hard real medicine and these ideas of energy just seemed very sort of hippie-like. And he was able to bring it into focus with some very real experiments. And one of the things we've realized now, because we're only actually coming to appreciate the work that this association did and, and what Dr. Manaka led as, a, as, a, as the main person of that group. There was several people who formed the group together, but then it grew with, a, with a, a, a kind of nucleus that then spread from there. 
And what he was looking at was the realization that we've seen now is that for anything to work in the body, for health to exist in the body, there has to be a movement of, um, of electricity in the body. That electricity in the body is moved through the natural processing of positive and negative ions. And so he realized quite quickly that if we applied some kind of assistance to that movement, we could get quite a dramatic uh, response from the body, either in repairing itself or in alleviating um, symptoms or in strengthening its ability to, to maintain its integrity, which was always the idea of, of the homeostatic model, which was looking at keeping regulation between the external and internal environment with the way the body was functioning at an organic level, level at a molecular level. So what we often see is, uh, in, like in Chasing the Dragon's Tail, we'll see the tip of the iceberg, really, because when you start to look at many of his associates' works as well, you find that uh, this permeated into uh, 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 an idea that offered us a lot of possibilities. And this was the first thing that I, I, I found was most important to me. When I learned, and this is no criticism, but it was a, a, a limitation for me in my TCM training, was that it was founded on, yes, you had this sort of point formulas that you would use. Uh, you would usually use herbs to supplement what you were doing. And, uh, you know, and, there, and then probably you might use a, a moxa stick or some cups if you were really... Um, stretched for what you were doing but generally most of it happened with some deep needling and some herbs and I started to find in my clinical reality that it wasn't cutting it for me uh, that what I would read in um, in the books that would resolve in 10 treatments wasn't happening and so I, my investigation led me to the Japanese systems and I quickly discovered the possibility of um, all these variables that weren't available to me in the way I, was, I had been taught or trained. So all of a sudden you had the capacity, what, what Dr. Manaka had, the brilliant ability to take from uh, great teachers, the synthesis, and incorporate it into the model that um, Oren was talking about, this four-step or five-step model, depending if you add the uh, home remedies. And then he would... Um, uh, be able to make it his own and this was quite strange at the time because typically most systems in Japan would follow uh, a particular school of thought and would dare not draw on other people per se because it would be that this was your lineage your tradition your style but he was very different in the sense that he saw the best in these great teachers and why waste such great wisdom so he you know no need to reinvent the wheel uh, he would bring in these things and he would be able to understand exactly how to place them in the right order and so his idea was if you did a great root treatment a constitutional treatment then your symptom treatment was reduced in how much you had to do the dosage of of that treatment and then on top of that he was able to recognize that you couldn't you couldn't neglect the musculoskeletal system because of um, structure and function in that octahedral model that Oren was talking about. And so if someone's structure had been compromised, then eventually it would lead to some kind of uh, malfunction in an organ. And, and so we see that he was all encompassing in how he understood the body and it was and, and he gave people the opportunity and the possibility not only of using a, a variety of tools, but also to be able to know right away whether you, what you were doing was working or not. And this was inherently important to me because I didn't feel comfortable giving a treatment and saying to the person, well, see how you go and let me know. I would like to know on the table if I'm on the right track. I would like to know that the person's feeling confidence in me as a practitioner that I'm doing something that, that is shifting for them. Now, 
of course, let's say someone comes in with a chronic illness they've had for 20 or 30 years, you can't imagine that's going to shift on the table in, in 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But what you can show them is that something is happening. So if you, for example, have reactive areas on the hara or the mu points, and these clear, then they know that something's moving in their body, that life is returning, that electricity, that ions are moving through their body. What we could call chi or energy, but, but basically their life force was returning to, act, to be active again. And this idea of correcting the or nudging the person towards the right direction of health was what encouraged people then to continue coming for treatment and to understand that treatment required a certain amount of, uh, of time. And recently I've come across some, some sheets that show that even from a Western physiological, biological model, that you cannot repair the body quicker than how long it would take, whether it's going to be for, you know, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the musculoskeletal system, all of these things, even if you go to a Western model, you're going, it's going to take time because the body takes time to repair these things. So simply uh, taking some kind of uh, pill or tablet that would suppress pain or symptoms wasn't equating to healing. And to communicate this to people and to get them to understand from uh, the model that was being presented by the octahedral system of Dr. Manaka that, that uh, you, you needed time to allow these things to correct and hold. And this was an important step as well because it allowed people to realize that they couldn't just come for treatment, give you one or two goes and disappear. They had to understand that that treatment required co some commitment. And so part of his his teaching showed education to the patient. That's what I liked about his home recommendation as well, because he realized that lifestyle, environment, uh, you know, an emotional state that someone was being subjected to for a prolonged period of time, you weren't just going to fix this on the table immediately, that there was going to be a, a, a need to impregnate the treatment with uh, education and home recommendation and then the realization that you know what you're doing is going to uh, be able to be validated by the person so it's not like that they're going to think oh, i don't know it could be better i might feel better they pretty much recognize it and so to finish my presentation i always i always like to tell the story of my first treatment, which was when I, my very first treatment I ever did from Dr. Manaka's work was his whiplash treatment. And I had a patient that had come in with 10 years of whiplash that couldn't move their neck. They had suffered for 10 years. And I put the cords on it at the end of the treatment, they were about 80% better moving their neck. And they hadn't moved their neck like that in over 10 years. And that was it for me. I was like, this is all I'm going to do for the rest of my life and it, and then it was like a rabbit hole because once I went into that work I realized that the 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 idea that his work was coming from what we could call today a, a modern day renaissance man it was profound it was deep he could see things that once you saw them you realized why didn't I see this it was so apparent once you once you uh, recognized it but but before then, it was almost like invisible. It's staring you right in the face and you don't realize, why don't I apply this principle? Why don't I add this point? Because it's this time of the day or et cetera, et cetera. And so he opened up a world to me that showed me that the body was, a, was based on chronobiology. I could, I could um, recognize that the individuality of the patient was really, really happening because of the time of day they were there the um the the the, the uh, season that it was you know the particularity of that um, person's constitution uh, these were all things that were missing for me before and it really made the treatment individual whereas again it's not a criticism but i always felt like okay if everyone ca if someone comes in and you've diagnosed them with um stuck liver chi for example pretty much everyone still got the same stuck liver chi points. So it wasn't very personal in that sense. Now, of course, there were practitioners doing things differently, but 
that's how we were taught. And it, again, it, it left me hungry for more. And he satiated that hunger and thirst in me. So that's what I, I find so um, powerful. And to this day, I'm still using it. No matter what else I've learned, it's always the core and fundamental of my practice. Mm, thank you, Paul. That was great. Yeah. Um, for, for me as well, I'd just like to reinforce some of the things that uh, Paul said. Um, there is a, a fantastic uh, placebo effect that goes with every manicure that, treatment that you do that Paul talked about. Because what you do a lot of the times, you press, you press the belly and you find tender tight points. And then when you put the ion pumping cords on, you do your step one treatment, those points change immediately. They change within 15 to 20 seconds. So it's like Paul says, people immediately feel, wow, something just happened. And it happened incredibly fast. One of the things patients often say to me is, does it really happen that quickly? Or they go, are you pressing the same point? Um, and they don't, they can't quite believe it, but they, they've sensed something's changed right away. So you know, within five minutes of lying on the table, they've noticed that something's changed. Now, it might not be that their, their whiplash has changed, uh, but they've noticed something changed on their belly. It hurt, it was uncomfortable, it was stiff, and then suddenly it's not. And that has um, a lot of, apart from the physical effect of what's happening, is that they suddenly start to believe in the treatment or trust the treatment. And that's a very profound thing that, I don't get when I'm taking the patient's pulse and I say to the patient, oh, your pulse changed. They go, yeah, right. But you know, I don't feel any different. But when you press their tummy, then they really feel the change. So I think that's, that's one of the, the great things about Manica. Um, so yeah, one of the things that I really love about it is, is that rapid feedback that is appreciated, not just by us as practitioners, but by patients right away. Thanks, Paul. That was a really uh, nice chat. So thanks for that and a nice introduction to, to the strengths of Manica. And um, I wonder if there are any questions. Uh, I'm sure there are. So why don't um, someone just unmute and ask a question and we'll, um, we'll see if we can answer it. Even if you have clinical cases that you, if you are working or if you're um, working from a different style and you'd like to know how the vet, you know, something would, um, uh, what you're doing from your style, how we would approach it from Dr. Manaka's work, anything is really, right. it's open table for you. Yeah, there's a question from Sangeeta. Hi, Sangeeta. Um, Sangeeta says, uh, did Dr. Manaka uh, use the ear in any way? Did he use ear points? Um, so, Paul, I'll let you kick off with that one. Yeah. So, he, he, he did. He actually, uh, he understood Noger's system of the, uh, of the ear, and he also knew the Chinese map. There's a lot of controversy around, you know, who developed the ear map first it's still going on within the from the um, different schools of thought but you know he preferred the Chinese map because he was quite simple in how he he liked to practice so the Chinese map was you find a tender point you would um, uh, you would use a probe typically and then he he would put uh, an intradermal in that point and he might combine that with what he called an isophasal treatment with a, a Korean hand point and then a body point. And that would be like a, a very powerful treatment to send the person home with. But uh, the reason he didn't use the Noger map was because the Noger map required a lot more participation in, at the time, using filters that you would bring to the uh, energy field of the of the person's uh, body through the ear and you would be checking the pulse and the pulse would uh, tell you how that person's uh, responding whether it's a weak or a strong and then he would use different filters on the body that would tell you on the different three uh, three different particular uh, parts of the ear the different um, uh, 
uh, endoderm, mesoderm, etc. And then you would apply other systems. So it was a Nogier system was very much kind of complex and complete. And Dr. Menaka was trying to take a synthesis out. And so he used this synthesis that was the Chinese map. And then he combined it with the intradermals or hinaishin. And that was very powerful for him. So he didn't need to go to that extensive level. Whereas a, a, pr a practitioner of auricular medicine doesn't do everything else and is using only the ear, therefore has the time to do that complexity of treatment. I, I say that because I don't want to diminish the Nogier's model of the ear acupuncture because it's very powerful and I do, I do use it and incorporate it within, within my treatments. So uh, I, I find it uh, very effective. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add, Oren. Yeah, I think I could um, just reinforce something that you said because um, Paul's already mentioned that Manika had this amazing ability to reach out to people who'd specialized in other fields and to bring their work into his. But every time he brought it in, he augmented it in some way. So, for example, he didn't just do ear acupuncture with people. He didn't just use the ear on its own in the way that the Chinese use ear acupuncture. Uh, what he did is he he started to think of it in terms of um, uh, systems in the body. So he said, OK, look, this is a holographic system. So let me do if someone's got back pain in L2, let me needle the point on the ear, which is relates to L2. So he would kind of go down uh, and find that point and find a tender point. And he put a, an intradermal there, like something that someone could wear and take away. And at the same time, he'd then go to the Korean hand model. So another holographic model of the body. And he'd look for the area corresponding to L2 on the hand. And he put an intradermal there. And then he'd go to the actual L2 area on the back. And he would uh, needle that point and he'd put an intradermal there. So in other words, for pain relief, he was doing the back in one system, the back on another system, and the back literally physically on the back. So what he called isophasal. So iso means the same and phase, phase or resonance. So using three points from different systems with three resonances. So that was how he he took ear acupuncture into the into his system. And he used it um, in step so very much for for uh, pain relief uh, and that, that that's called Manica's isophasal pain relief treatment um, okay we've got a few more uh, we've got a few quite a few more questions in the chat now so um, thanks for that Sangeeta uh, Phil asked I'm curious to know more about the time in the treatments Paul being able mentioned to mentioned being able to see uh, this effect on his clients? Well, I'll kick off with that. Um, it's interesting that um, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who, who, when I was a teenager, I used to believe in astrology and, uh, you know, oh, I'm a Cancerian and he's a Leo and, you know, he's a, an Aquarian and I would pretend to myself that I could guess people's personalities. But then as I grew more rational, I started to think, well, how can they possibly have any effect? Um, but then Manica came along and he started talking about the Chinese clock and the Chinese clock uh, and stems and branches are all related to astrological practices in Chinese medicine. Now, Manica is not someone I mean, Manika is someone who would start off his lectures by saying, don't believe what I'm going to tell you. And what he meant by that is, um, please go away and test what I'm saying. Don't just take it as because I've said it, that it's true. And he wanted everything that he did to be repeatable by other people. And so he also wanted to test assumptions within Chinese medicine. And one of the things that he tested very rigorously was stems and branches and 24 hour clock. Um, and he devised uh, a load of treatments that he thought uh, worked uh, in relation to uh, 
10 day cycles, 60 day cycles and 24 hour cycles. And um, th there are so many things that he came up with and I don't think we'll talk about them all in any detail, but just uh, for example, in terms of 24 hour clock, um, he might say, well, look, uh, at this time of day, uh, it's spleen time. So perhaps you could find, um, and this person's got muscular spasm. So muscular spasm belongs to wood elements. So why don't you needle a wood point on the spleen channel? Because this, that person's come to see you at spleen time. So he was able to take these ideas of the 24 hour clock and make quite workable treatments from them. Now, he also devised a whole load of treatments uh, using uh, open points uh, on the 10 day and, 20, uh, and 60 day cycles. So those things were very important to him and um, the kind of things that we explain kind of on the third weekend. Uh, and so for someone coming from a kind of semi-rational point of view like mine, uh, I, I really had a while to get my head around these treatments until I saw that they worked. Like when I actually needle an open point according to Manica's system, I can see immediate changes on the belly or I can say, or the patient's saying, oh, my neck feels better now. So I've realized that for whatever reason, these points work. Now, maybe the explanation of the stars spinning around in the galaxies is not the right explanation, and they are um, biorhythmic uh, things which have been explained in terms of um, the movement of the heavens. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, he tested them he made them into principles and those principles we can take into our practice and are repeatable and effective. Uh, Paul, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. Yeah, it's, it is, it's a mysterious thing, but we are interconnected. Uh, we have this sense of self being so isolated when we look at another person, when we look at nature, but in fact, we're, we're really impregnated at an atomic level in a connection with everything. And the ideas that Oren was talking about of the 60 day cycle and 10 day cycle, which are the, the heaven, heavenly um, uh, the branches and the stems and branches of the heavens and the earth and uh, this intercommunication of all these energies. One of the brilliant aspects from the work of Dr. Manaka for me was that when you see a person in clinic, to try to isolate them to a label, which was what they were used to at the time, which was a disease name, and then to sort of treat them as a disease name, well, we would have to try to diagnose them in TCM to a syndrome, and then you treat that syndrome. But the reality was that a human being is very complex, and all of the scenarios that are happening in their life uh, you know you're trying to sort of pick a starting point and what Dr. Manaka created was a great idea which was this non-pattern root treatment where you could use the combination of of um, the biorhythmic or chronobiological available available points that would just treat their whole sense of well-being and then my favorite one using this idea is to combine the nature of the movement of the five elements with the time of the of the clock so you know he'd find various patterns um, on the on the midline or on the palm that relate to the, um, the the five elements and he'd find that five element that was most reactive whether through pressure or an o-ring test and then he would say well you're here right now at spleen time so i'm going to use the earth point of that channel that is disrupted right now and then you'd see a big shift in that discomfort or in the strength of the o-ring and and of course um his colleagues that were working in the topology association had other ways of testing this as well so dr manaka used to use the five tonal sounds of the the five elements and one of his associates would use the um 
the tuning fork. So I have the tuning forks and you can use the tuning forks to hold on the belly or on the on the palm of the hand and and that would tell you which element was was off and then you can go from there to treat that point and then come back and you know again the, the reaction would change. So creating a a simplification when someone's disease is very complex like today we have autoimmune diseases that bring in all the systems of the body and to simply choose one of them and say I'm going to treat only that may not do it whereas treating the whole body can give a boost and for this the chronobiology or the time serves I think as the strongest foundation. Great thank you. Paul I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, hand the next question to you. Someone's asked me, asked us uh, what the difference is between Manica system and Kauai system. And I have to say that I'm not familiar with Kauai system, but Paul, maybe you can say a few words because I know you are. Yes, thanks, Oren. Yeah, look, Kauai was one of the f sort of founding people with Dr. Manaka in the Topology Association. And he, uh, he, w one of the main differences was that uh, he, used instead of the uh, ion pumping cords which were um, like unilateral he created what are called the triple bypass cords and these create like a circular motion so instead of having a diode only in one clip you have two clips with diodes and so the way you apply these was very different and the initial use of these cords required some kind of um, kick to start the journey so they used to use the hibiki 7 which was a, a little acupuncture point locator and electro device because it it had the right uh, frequency that the body could could manage and so the cords even the ion, ion pumping cords could tolerate this little electrical kick and so you find a lot of the initial mo practices in the work we used to use this and then Kawhi developed the, the Pachi Pachi which is like a barbecue kind of sparker that you attach the black uh, clip which is earthing at the at the earth bit and then you would you would spark you could spark um, the, the needles of the others or you could spark the foil or or so forth and he went on further to then incorporate ideas Dr. Manaka used a silver a silver ring that he would place on different places like the scar or something like this and and Kawhi developed a gold uh, gold rings uh, with magnets that had diodes on them and copper rings and then he he used the capacity of the movement of energy at the fingers and toes or um, locally at sites and then you could apply the you could use these on, alone or you could apply the the cords to them and uh, he, he has a, a profound system. Uh, one of the other biggest shifts for him was that he really loved uh, in his step two, he would always put um, uh, warm needle moxa, but on a lot of places, not just the back shoe points. And his step three was often again, uh, 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 triple bypass cords in a symptomatic relief way. And the last thing I'll say is that his step one was also very different because he simplified the traditional um, eight extraordinary patterns that Dr. Manaka developed, which you could um, change from, you know, Yin Chao, Ren Mai or Ren Mai, Yin Chao being master couple. He developed uh, into two systems, which he called the Chow Chow and the Wei Wei method. And so his root treatment was typically, um, you would ascertain where, whether it was the Yang Wei and Yang, um, Yang Wei, Dai Mai, um, Yin Wei, Chong Mai, and then pair those in a cross body fashion. Um, so it's a, it's a little simpler to learn in, in, in the step one, but in his symptom controls, it's much more complicated because the application of the chords um, are quite varied and there's a lot of them to learn. I mean, he, he and he, he used different Western kind of diseases, Bell's, pal Bell's palsy, um, you know, endocrine disorders, uh, gynecological stuff, etc., etc. And um, but his treatments are brilliant. You know, as, a, as I said, all of these all these characters that were part of the Topology Association, their treatments were were remarkable. OK, thank you very much for that. 
we've got quite a few more questions. Um, and I think these questions are from people who are practicing Manaka now. So uh, one, uh, Aswadi, hi, nice to see you. Uh, Aswadi says, patients always ask me about what's going on once their abdomen is resolved. Well, what, what to say to patients when there's changes with their abdomen? In other words, how to explain the changes that they're experiencing? I think that's the question. So, um, whoops, I've lost the chat. There we go. Uh, okay, so I think I can try and answer that. Um, when patients say, what's going on? What does this mean? Um, you know, you're prodding on the abdomen and then you find a tender point. So then your patients instantly get worried. Oh, does, is that bad? What's that? Is that my small intestine? Is that my, is that my appendix? Uh, and then you put ion pumping cords on and that reaction disappears. So how do you explain that to them? What I tell them is traditional theory. I say you can think of the abdomen as a map of the body or a, a dashboard like the dashboard on your car. And these tender points are amber lights uh, that are showing that there's a blockage in the engine or that there's something not moving. And what I've done is I've put ion pumping cords on and I've reestablished that flow. So now the dashboard, the, the light has gone from amber to green. So that's why it's not tender anymore. So I explain it just very much in terms of mappings. I say, you know, this, this part up here in the upper right hand quadrant of your tummy relates to things going on perhaps in the upper right hand part of your body and this thing going down here in the lower left hand quadrant of your abdomen relates to things going on you know literally in the lower left hand quadrant of your body so i make those physical mappings with people to try and uh, help people explain now i mean those are simplifications uh, but as far as patients are concerned those work so that's how i would answer that question um, there's another question, uh, which is, uh, which is more important in the Manica system, the pulse or the abdomen? Uh, so Paul, I think you can explain that. <laughs> well, it, uh, Dr. Manaka knew the pulse very well. He had studied meridian therapy, uh, with the great practitioners at the time. It is more complex to learn the pulse, definitely. And there's a lot more uh, room for error in, in pulse taking because there are a lot of ways we can bias our pulse taking. So the belly tends to be much easier to, to find what you're looking for as long as you're not eliciting pain and you train yourself how to meth methodically and repeatedly palpate in the same way. So... I think in, in Dr. Manaka's work, he doesn't ignore that the pulse is important. He just feels for the sake of the work that he's doing, the capacity of verifying your treatment, the hara and the mu points uh, are much easier to, to validate and, and also the patient can validate. Whereas as Oren was saying, when you're feeling someone's pulse and you see a big shift, sometimes they don't see anything at the moment at that moment because it may require for that some time to move through it through the system so it's starting there at the radial pulse where you feel it's 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 improving but like a wave like a tsunami it's going to sort of move through the body and then the person is going to start feeling well but with a with a reactive zone they can tell right away and um we have to remember that the hara traditionally, because we often think of just the belly when we talk about the hara, but traditionally the hara was, was from the neck down to the pubic symphysis, you know, front and back. So, you know, palpating areas through the neck, uh, palpating areas around um, you know, the upper chest, uh, and, and when we go to the shoe points, all of that is part of the hara as well. And so in step two, when you turn the person over and, 
you're going to be looking for these reactive points. It's more important to find the reactive area than to you know, measure precisely the vertebrate to say, oh, this is bladder 20, for example. Whereas you're going to be looking for what, you know, the reactive zone. And it may not be, it may, it, you may want it to be bladder 20, but it's not bladder 20. You know, it may be where the reactive one is, you know, is whatever. Maybe it's bladder 18 or maybe it's, it's, it's bladder 43 or, you know. So it may be that it's somewhere else completely that you have to treat. So the back will tell you, the body will tell you. And I, I think people always get surprised when I tell them that acupuncture points don't exist until we're, until we're, we're diseased. Like people have this idea that the acupuncture points are always there. And I explain to them that it's uh, similar to what Aaron was mentioning a moment ago, but I use the analogy of a, of a, a highway with a traffic uh, congestion or an accident. Uh, the, you know, the fact is that what we have all the time is channels and the chi moving through the channels. When there's a problem, then a point will appear telling us that something has to be done there. So hopefully that, that, that can be um, mm. clarif clarified enough. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, okay, we've got, uh, we've got lots more questions. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, so are, are ion pumping cords the only way to do Manica style acupuncture? And can you please tell me uh, more about its effectiveness in neurological conditions, especially brain stroke cases? And how can we learn more? So that's three questions from one person. <laughs> okay, but they're, they're all related. Um, Okay, so going back to uh, the four step protocol, um, if you remember the four steps of Manico, step one is release the abdomen. And remember, I had a little image of a um, kit bag. And step two was release the, the yang aspect of the body. Step three was structural adjustment. And step four was symptom relief. So uh, sometimes, you can achieve the goal of step one with things other than ion pumping cords. And Dr. Manica was certainly not doctrinaire in any way. He didn't say you have to use ion pumping cords at step one, far from it. So we've already seen that he used the 24 hour clock and 10 day cycles and 60 day cycles. And that could also achieve the goal of step one. And he also used whole body moxibustion treatments. And those also achieve the goal of step one and step two. So uh, as long as you're thinking in terms of the structure of the body, it doesn't matter whether you use ion pumping cords or not. So the first question, so I think that the first thing is uh, you don't have to do that, um, but they certainly help. And uh, I'd say one more thing about ion pumping cords and Paul has already touched on this, which is this. The octahedral model comes from this idea of the eight extras coming into existence during embryo stage. Within those first three divisions of the zygote, you've already got these axes and you've already got the octahedron. And those cells have got no nerves to signal each other. They're signaling to each other in terms of fields. And this is what Manica called um, the X signal system. He, he didn't want to use the word chi. He wanted to call it something more broad, an information highway or an information system. And this system is a really low energy system. And what Manica said is that the meridians start to form first and they regulate the growth of the embryo. And then gradually nerve cells start to develop. And those are kind of like higher energy systems and the endocrine system develops and various other signaling systems develop. So they start to overlay the foundations built by the meridian system, which is still there in the background, like a very quiet top clock ticking away. So if you want to talk to that system, you need to talk to it with a very low energy way of talking. In other words, um, you know, there's something in NLP that if you meet, you know, if a patient comes into the room and they're talking in a really loud voice, then in order to 
talk to them, you need to talk to them at their frequency, you need to talk to them back in a loud voice. And once you're matching with them, then you can reduce your voice and then they start to talk more quietly. So there's this concept of matching in NLP, neuro linguistic programming. So it's the same thing with the body. If you want to talk to the meridian system, you have to talk really quietly. And ion pumping cords are a way in which you can do that. You can talk very quietly because they're not, it's not electroacupuncture. You're not putting any current into the body. You're using these natural flows and voltages within the body, these micro voltages and micro currents, which speak to the meridian system. So having said that, there are many options at step one. Some of them are not with ion pumping cords. Uh, ion pumping cords and other polarity devices are very useful. So thanks for that question. And your last question was, is it good for neurological conditions? Uh, Paul, I'll let you go for that one. Uh, well, we could say that if we use, uh, you know, ideas from the way we, we perceive the body biomolecularly or physiologically yes pretty much it doesn't matter what we call it you know it, there's always going to be something in the way we understand it from a east asian medicine perspective for example we don't find a, a hormone an endocrine model in the traditional chinese medical literature per se but we definitely can see that there are treatments that seem to be treating what we what we would call today the endocrine model and so when I think of a neurological uh, treatment, I immediately think of the spine and think of Dumai. So I would be thinking of a, you know, a Yang Chao Dumai treatment possibly, or could be um, the possibility of, um, of other treatments like that come out uh, not just from Dr. Manaka, but from his associates. There, there are, like in Dr. Kawai's work, for example, he had a bunch of uh, neurological treatments. And, but applying the principles of the ion pumping cords, we quickly realize that any neurological condition can be treated because of the recognition that where there is numbness, paralysis uh, that has affected the tissue, uh, that you have uh, too many negative ions there. And so you want to bring in positive ions from somewhere, redistribute them from somewhere in the body. And so your placement of your red or black clip is going to be very important in, in neurological conditions. Uh, conversely, if there was a neurological condition where there was inflammation, then you'd be putting the black clip there to take out the excess positive ions. So another way of thinking of the cords is not just master couple, but in symptomatic, uh, in, in a symptomatic way, recognizing what the body's uh, demonstrating from the condition that it's in, in, inflammation or paralysis and numbness, and then using the, the, the direction of the movement of the, of the ions accordingly. And in that way, we can treat neurological conditions. So, you know, like a Bell's palsy, for example, we might have you know, like a, a numbness there initially, but then you press a little bit into that and there'll be pain. So sometimes some things are a little confusing. What do you, what do you treat? Do you treat the numbness or the, or the pain? I always treat the numbness first to get the circulation going and that seems to work and then come back and fix the rest of the stuff. So I, I think that's probably the simplest way to, to answer it. Thanks very much, Paul. Well, guys, that hour went very quickly, didn't it? Um, so uh, I think um, th there is the, the final part of your question there is how can we learn more Manica? Um, well, uh, I'd like to try and answer that. Uh, the only person who's got online material about Manica at the moment is, is our Paul here. Uh, and you can go to the Net of Knowledge website to, uh, I think you've got a couple of uh, short introductions to Manica there. And so you can do distance learning. But of course, the best way to study Manica is in person. Um, so Stephen Birch teaches in Europe, 
and in other countries as well. So keep an eye on Stephen Birch. Paul teaches in Australia and he does a lot of work uh, teaching in Australia. Um, Brenda Lowe, uh, who I, I was hoping would join us today, but maybe we'll get her in for a panel discussion uh, in a month or two. Um, uh, Brenda Lowe teaches in the US and North America, and uh, I am teaching here and there. Uh, so it's possible I might be teaching in Indonesia uh, in this year, and I'm teaching in Brazil uh, this year in terms of Manica. Um, so just keep an eye out for us. Um, and certainly you can go to Net of Knowledge and see what Paul has. Paul has some short introductions there. Paul, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that that pretty much covers it. I mean, of course, the last few years have been really hard to to do anything. So, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> I mean, uh, but uh, uh, you know, hoping that in um, in the when we do the courses in Australia that uh, they're going to they're being filmed right now as I do courses and those courses will eventually all come up on net of knowledge and I think that uh, but as Oren says of course to, to have someone teach you directly is best but you know at least that's a starting point and that can encourage people to then seek someone out to you know one of us to to do this but I think it's a um, Oren and I were talking uh, a few days ago about the fact that this work, that uh, the, the legacy of Dr. Manaka's work is something that uh, it's really up to us to, to continue. And, uh, and so I think once people have been exposed to it, the comments I've always received especially from people in Australia and New Zealand, is that they probably wouldn't be practicing today if they hadn't started with Dr. Manaka's work because it, it, it really allowed their clinic to thrive. And, um, and so that's probably my greatest recommendation is that if you do study it, if you haven't studied it, or if you have studied it, please realize that there's so much more to learn. Just simply learning it, the basic four steps is, is, is really just the beginning of it. And um, so for that reason, I created what's called the Polarity Medicine course, which goes to the levels of the other teachers, in particular Kauai. But then um, in the future, I want to introduce also some of the other great teachers using uh, the divergent meridians and, and other patterns, um, combining divergent meridians with body clock. And so there's, there's, there's so much more to learn. So I just want I just want to emphasize that we should never feel just because we've learnt it that we know what Dr. Manaka's work is and just apply the chords and that's all there is to it. There's heaps more to learn. Okay, cool. That's great. I mean, I, I just say that is that Manaka changed my life. Oh, Stephen changed my life through Manaka. Manaka's changed Stephen's life. He said it was like being infected with a curiosity virus studying with Dr. Manica. And Steve managed to infect me and Paul as well. So <laughs> uh, it's really, um, uh, if you get the chance to study with uh, Manica, please do, because it will revolutionize your practice. It's such an amazing way of looking at the body. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. It's been really a pleasure. And that hour went incredibly quickly. I was amazed. So thanks very much. And we'll put on another one of these in the future. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Soren. Thank thanks. you.